It's um. This is one that wanted to. I'm Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Visible Visionaries Book Writing Group. We meet twice a month on Zoom, and we have people from all over the world who come in because they know that they can write their book and write a highly engaging book from idea and inception to being published. And if you are interested in this class, you can go to debbiedashinger.com, look at the spelling, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash visible visionaries uh, just to check in everybody can hear me okay just give me a thumbs up okay great i want to make sure my microphone is close enough and if not <laughs> we'll put it as close as it needs to be uh, so i'm excited because we work on our books people in the class read their work they get feedback and they get guidance about the entire process of books. So not only am I a book writing coach, but I also once your book is almost done, people come on board so I can take their book to a guaranteed international bestseller. And it's a beautiful package, fully done for the author. And you can find out more at debbiedashinger.com. If you guys don't mind um, in the beginning, just to mute yourself, that would be awesome. And how today is going to go. Yes, please mute yourselves. And I welcome everybody today because it's a very special day. I've got a special guest here. And I do this every so often in class because I find it even inspiring to learn from people who are out there doing this coaching work and seeing what kind of tips they have you know, in ways that they inspire. I know we end up talking sometimes, even after these classes about ways that th these guests have influenced you. We've had publishers and digital marketers. And today we have somebody who specializes in editing as well as storytelling, both essential for any writer and for any book. So besides me and debbiedashingercom slash visible visionaries, Here's how today will go. Uh, no problem, Art, at all. Um, so glad you're here. So today, how, how today is going to go is I'm going to engage in conversation with Susan, like an interview, but it's a conversation. And I'll be asking her a lot of questions for about the first 50 to 60 minutes. After that, we're going to open up to questions from you and then you can engage directly with Susan. And so I'll be operating the camera at the same time. And um, it's on me right now, later on it'll be on me and Susan. And then when I open it up, you'll also be on camera. I wanna also let you know, because I always ask everybody who comes into this as a guest expert, what do you have that my students might need? And so I think this is super exciting. So I'm gonna tell you now, I'm also gonna put it in the chat and then I'll, I'll do a reminder later as well. So if you are ready to have a portion of your manuscript professionally edited so you can test drive the editing relationship and get some honest but compassionate feedback on your writing, then Susan's editing package is the thing for you. And as you guys know, I have told you, and this is just another illustration, never put your book out and say, I read through it, it's okay. I, I won't even take on an international best-selling book project unless this a book has been professionally edited. You've put so much energy into your book, you, you're birthing it, you know, we're, I'm the doula for you to help it get out there. And why at the ninth inning would you then say, ah, I'm gonna take the amateur way out because there are so many books that get published and they have typos everywhere. And it takes your book from the beautiful brilliance it is into complete mediocre land. And you're not worthy of that. You are worthy and deserving of something much better. So Susan created something specifically for my community. It leverages Susan Crossman's decades of professional editing, writing experience and thousands of hours that she's trained in the areas of linguistics, reader engagement, and personal transformation. So the result of your working with her in this package is a professionally edited sample of your ma manuscript, and it moves your book forward in significant and resonant ways. She is as a special offering you 5,000 words for $497. I am going to give you this information again in the chat 
So you can copy paste and save it. And should you decide to work with her, and I hope you will, I hope you work with an editor, uh, you'll have this information at the hand. And I think it's really nice because you'll get to know her today. And I think that's very important, you know, not to fly blind, not to hope you're working with somebody great, but to know you've got somebody amazing on your team. Okay, and I'm also going to just do the very uh, bottom URL independently so you can see it here too, if you just want to copy that. Okay, great. So good place to start. So with that, I'm going to welcome the amazing Susan Crossman to this experience. I'm going to pin you, Susan. I'm going to pin myself and we will be together. How are you? And it's so good to see you. Uh, Debbie, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. A few familiar faces in this group. So great to see you all here and especially so excited that you're all here in service to your books. Mm. I am so thrilled uh, at the work that you do, Debbie, and know that we're really aligned on a heart basis. And so it's always really an honor to be with you and to be here in service. So thank you. Awesome. Yes. And Susan and I just did, um, she does a telesummit about book writing and all the facets. And so she and I just did, um, she brought me in to speak to her group. And some of you here uh, saw the newsletter that I put out and you joined the telesummit and you were there when I taught. So, you know, this is a nice full circle, I think, to introduce okay. her to you now. So Susan, I want to start with self editing recommendations that you have before an author turns their book over to an editor. What are the questions that a writer and author should be asking themselves over their draft copy as they begin revising their story or their novel? Great question. And there is a lot people can do from a self-editing perspective. And, uh, you know, there, I actually, I have an editing checklist that I'll make available to you too, Debbie, that you can circulate if you like. There are a lot of little things that you can do in order to make sure the manuscript is uh, sounding good. For example, there is a dictation function in Word, which maybe not everybody knew, um, and a read aloud function in Word, you can have, you can read that aloud yourself, or you can ask Word to read aloud. And often our, our ears pick up errors or uh, inconsistencies in the sentence that our eyes missed. A, a lot of people miss mistakes when they're looking at it. And a big part of that is because we become so close to the information when we're writing that it, it's, it is so much a part of us that we aren't tracking for, mm, yeah, is that going to make sense to someone else who doesn't have the story living inside them? So that would be my number one rec uh, recommendation is to read it aloud or have word read it aloud. Start with that. That's so cool. And that completely echoes what I tell them all the time. Always, always uh, don't edit while you write. Worst thing you could do. No. And when you are complete, for me, the way I explain it is it's about the musicality. It's the first time you're really hearing your book. You often gain a lot of wisdom hearing it, but there is something magical. I think we resist the heck out of reading our own book. My God, I did so much work. I, why do I have to read it now? There's all this stuff. I went through it too. And every time I sat down, I was like, whoa, that's a really good book. And I was able to see what needed to be changed where the disharmony was, where the harmony was, something was needed. So I love that you start there. And just some of the elements that I took uh, researching you, so people know is, you know, where does the story really begin? Is this adverb necessary? Is this adject ad adjective? You have to put the emphasis on the right word. Is this adjective doing its job? Whose problem is it? Are the grammar and spelling perfect? Have I read my story aloud? Exactly. Exactly. And and pare it down. You know, a lot of people feel they have to be really fancy in their writing. No, mm. actually, we want to keep those sentences as simple and straightforward as we can, using as little language as necessary in order to get the point across. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that 
kind of throws a lot of people as they, they feel they have this mantle of being an authority on them and that means they have to be complicated. No, pare it down wherever you can. In fact, I worked in journalism for a number of years, daily newspapers, and that was the whole rule of thumb. When I wrote an article, the next editor up the line for me would say, okay, I want you to redo this and I want you to take out 35% of the words. It's so hard. What? Yeah, I know. So when I was this little cub reporter anxious to make my mark in the journalism field, it was like, well, no, because those are my babies. Every single one of those words is important. And it, it wasn't, <laughs> you know, they weren't. You, you can always make it simpler. And I would say for anyone who's trying to improve their clarity in their writing, make it simpler. Beautiful. And you'll have to forgive there's some planes flying over. It's very interesting. So if it gets loud, I'm trying to mute and unmute. Uh, so the next question is, what questions should a writer ask a potential editor they're going to hire before actually hiring them? What kind of process would you recommend? Yeah, uh, that's a really juicy question. I really, really like that because you should ask your editor a lot of questions. Your editor is on your team. They are not some bizarre judge that's sitting there going to think worse of you because the language isn't perfect, the grammar isn't perfect. Your editor ideally is someone who wants your success as much as you do. And so when you're interviewing an editor, and I do recommend you interview two or three people, if not more, until you find the right fit, that you first of all ask them, you know, what's your approach to editing? How do you see this editing relationship? Because it is a relationship. You are in a relationship with that editor. And it's a relationship that may go on for a very long time. I've had people that I've worked with for two or three years in the editing process as they craft their book and make it wow. stronger and think of new ideas. And they have that one conversation with someone that changed their life. And then suddenly they go back and they want to add new elements into their book. So you know, they, it, it can go on for quite a long time. And you want someone who's really compassionate and patient while you're going through that experience as the author. So number one, you know, what's their approach to editing? What are they editing for? So editors work at a number of different levels. We have the developmental, sometimes called a structural edit. And that's the big picture look at the overall arc of the book. So, and, and I, I work at both a developmental level and a copy level, level, which is the granular level. But if you're hiring a developmental editor, you, you wanna know a little bit about how they see story because that's where story happens from beginning to end of your book. There's a narrative, a journey you're taking your readers on. And you wanna make sure that your editor has that sense of the big picture, the vision. I think you wanna ask them a little bit about their experience. You know, have they had experience writing your kind of book? Mm -hmm. I am not a technical editor. I'm not a technical writer either. I, I, technical means uh, computers and engineering and that kind of thing, because there are certainly lots of books that get written in those areas. I'm not your gal. I, I don't know anything about those areas. I, am, I have enough integrity that I would say to somebody, mm, no, here, but let me find you someone else who might be able to help you. But you, you want to make sure that your editor is a match for the topic that you're, that you're writing on. Uh, I would also want to know a little bit about their worldview. An editor brings the, their entire selves to their editing. And so if they are a person with a lot of very strict opinions about religion, about culture, about uh, gender identity and that kind of thing, well, just know that they're bringing those biases into the book with them as they edit. They can't help it. It's happening at a subconscious level. But the, the more um, open an individual is, then perhaps the more appropriate they are as an editor for your book. So you kind of want to get a sense of their worldview. If you're writing a book, for example, about hmm, how, to, how to create a thriving family, you might want to know whether your editor is has children. Have they ever had children? Because if you know they can make some good guesses about what your book might look like, but they won't have that granular day-to-day -day detail about, hmm, you know, have you thought of this? Because 
And I guess that's the other thing. Sorry, I'm carrying on. This is really exciting for me. But that's the other thing. Are they going to ask you good questions that will help the best come out of you in the writing of the book? So I find when I'm writing, particularly at that big picture level, there are things that don't always make sense. And I often will catch these little things and go, well, wait a minute. You know, back on page 52, you said this. Now you're saying this. They seem to be colliding. Do you think you could clarify that little discrepancy there? Or you might come to an area where mm, that's not logical. Like I can't, I don't, I don't get what you're getting at there. You, you want someone who's not afraid to point out little areas where you may have forgot to explain some details that are deep within your own neurology. Like you, you know the details, but you just might have forgotten to explain a little piece of that concept in the paper. So. So I would say that's important. So the structural editor is the big picture editor, and then the copy editors are the people who really look at the grammar and the sentence structure and, and uh, punctuation and that kind of thing. So what you, it, what you don't wanna do is ask a copy editor to give you a sense of the big picture of your book. Your, your copy editor is more likely to just care about the grammar and the sentences and so on. A developmental editor will give you great feedback on what you can do to improve that manuscript. Yes. So I would say that's an, another piece. Um, you, you would like also your editor to be asking you some questions. You, I think, ideally want your editor to ask you, well, why are you writing this book? Because your editor needs to know what your goals are in order to serve you best. Ideally, you would like your editor to ask you a little bit about what you want to convey to your readers. What is the goal of this book? Like, what journey do you want to take your readers on? And what do you want to leave them with? What's the gift that you're leaving them with that you want to make sure is baked into this book? Because your editor will find many, many, many opportunities to nudge the language and the meaning along your way if they know what it is you're trying to achieve. So I would want my editor to ask that kind of question. And I think also, how do you want to be perceived by your readers? You want your, your editor to be asking that question. How do you want to be perceived? What's your brand? And what's your, the, the points of your credibility that you want to make sure are really clear to your readers? So those Can are you some give some examples of that when you say how somebody wants to perceive be perceived, what kind of ways might someone want to be perceived? Sure, that's a good, really good question. Well, do you want to be perceived as the hands down authority? There is nobody who knows more about this than I do. That's a quite of a, an assertive perception in the minds of your reader that, wow, this, this, this author knows everything. Uh, or do you want to be perceived as very compassionate and kind and caring? because that's a different tone that you're bringing to the book. I've had authors who they really have very gentle personalities, but they know an incredible amount about what they're doing. So they're stepping into that authority. And so they wanna find a halfway um, tone to what they're presenting so that they are presenting information that's very powerful and credible. At the same time, they're perceived as approachable. And so that's, again, those are things that you can bake into the, the words that are used, the kind of words that are used. I had one uh, author, they, I was editing her book and she came back to me and we had one round of edits. She came back and she said, oh, no, 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 no. You've used the word challenge in here. I don't use that word challenge. Well, I hadn't thought to ask, you know, were there words I'm not supposed to use? But that was something she said, no. She doesn't want her readers to perceive things as challenges. They, needed, they need to be perceived as opportunities. So we had to go back through that book and take out every single instance of the word challenge because her worldview was very much one where there are no challenges. And that was part of her brand was it's not a challenge, it's an opportunity. And so that was really important to this author. So that, that's the kind of thing that you look for and and you know ideally you want your editor to be aware that there are words that you use and words that you don't use and that you have a brand persona that you're trying to convey to your readers yeah yeah i know acronyms is another big thing when authors are writing and they they hand it over to an editor and the editor is like 
uh, I don't really know what that stands for. Can you please illuminate me? That can pop a lot, um, jargon yeah. and so forth. And, you know, I'm curious because I have a client right now. It's a really interesting setup. He's a, a best bestseller. He's part of the best selling book program. And first time author, um, I could say a lot about that, but first time authors really uh, have a hard time. And this question is going to be about letting go because he's got this amazing gal sleepless nights editing his book and she's written to me complaining that she'll do all these edits and then he'll come in and start tweaking the edits and then she, she's like this job is never going to be done we've had to postpone their launch so many times when is it important for an author to take their pause off of a book and pause to stop the writing process and let go so that they can give birth? Mm -hmm. That's that's an important question. And I love your questions, by the way, Debbie. It's fabulous and so important for people to know mm -hmm. about. So yes, it's it's very true. Some people get very deep into their books and they, they don't ever want to let it go. As you pointed out, they are not ready to let it go. And I think ideally when you're working with an editor, you have to trust that person which goes back to some of the questions you might ask of your editor should relate to a point that you get to where you feel there's some rapport there and you trust that person to be on your team and, and your partner. That, that situation maybe says to me a little bit that, that that relationship hadn't developed to a point where the author trusted the editor to know when enough, you know, to, to trust their judgment in those things. Or maybe that there hadn't been a conversation ahead of time where the author had an opportunity to give chapter and verse what they're looking for and explain what it is they're trying to do. Because if the author is still trying to work on that book that to that extent during the editing process, it sounds as though the, editor, the author is feeling their vision hasn't been fully transferred into the book itself. And maybe, or maybe there's not quite a shared vision there. And I can, and that would drive me a little bit nuts too. And that's why I always have lots of conversations with people so that I know what it is they're trying to, to achieve. I think if you understand that your editor is a professional and that's the thing, editing is a profession. It's not just that somebody wakes up one day, actually it shouldn't be, that somebody wakes up one day and decides they're going to edit some books. And there are some people like that out there. But it's a profession and, and we spend, the, a really good editor will spend their entire life becoming better at the craft of writing mm -hmm. and the craft of editing. And while you, the author, have spent your entire lives becoming experts in your field, your editor has spent their entire lives becoming experts at language. And so the two need to work together. And so you do have to trust that you have someone on your team who is perhaps better, should be better at language than you are. And that's why you're hiring them is to take your brilliance and amplify it out into the world so that your readers really get how brilliant you are. They see it. They can tell because they're reading that book and they're blown away by your ideas. And that's what your editor is supposed to be doing for you is helping you translate all of this brilliance out into the world in language that really resonates with your ideal reader. Yes, I, I actually wrote, uh -huh. <laughs> I wrote a note. I'm going to follow up with them after this and just offer a little loving guidance. Um, I think it'll create her sanity too, because she's doing an amazing job. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I am so grateful my mom, by the way, was a professional musician and a professional editor. And she did all sorts of, I don't know how she did it because it's such intense, it is kind of intense work. And, um, but she edited all my books. And so I have a lot of gratitude for the work you do in this process and incredible how you can help craft a book. And the fact that you brought up Susan that there are many types of editing out there and people, authors don't even realize it. They think I'm going to hire an editor thinking that'll cover everything and I'll just keep it simple rather than a laundry list. Let's just name three, like you said, developmental editing, 
copy editing, proofreading. And it's really important to know if you're a traditional published book, you're going to go through all three of these stages. So what does editing include? What are the kind of things you feel, well, especially you, since it's you, what's your wheelhouse? I and mean, what are kind of golden things do you bring to the process? Well, my wheelhouse is actually bringing transformational concepts into the language and into the story and into the reader's experience. And that's really the, the path that I've been on probably for the last 10 years is how do we, how do we create books that make a difference? Not just burnish our reputation and allow people to see us in our authority, but also that really move the dial on human behavior. And there are a lot of things that go into that from language that um, language that moves hearts and inspires change. Like there are language patterns that actually make a difference in in how people perceive themselves. So you can and I'm I'm I have a lot of training in neuro linguistic programming. Actually, that was my my gateway to using language to change to change behavior. But there are a lot of language patterns that have come out of neuro linguistic programming for me. It's something as simple as asking a question. Does it always have to be this way? You know, do you always have to do things the way you've always done them? That that help people shift a little bit inside from where they are. So so at a real language level, I'm really, really, really accomplished. Like I've spent my entire life with language, but also it's language that that helps people change the way they've been doing things. Um, beyond that, though, I'm really, really good with the big picture and where people are missing opportunities to to impact their readers. You know, that you can have a, a decent book. It's, it's, you know, you can end up with a decent book, but you know, do you really just want a decent book? Don't you want a book that absolutely blows the doors off people's yes. way of being in the world? And and that takes a, a whole lot of skill with the birthing, the, the midwifery, the doula that goes into that, which is, you know, fabulous that you're providing that, Debbie, with helping people think bigger about their book. And also when it comes to the editing, well, let's polish that up a little bit too. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Well, wait a minute, you could do this. And, you know, do you have calls to action in your book? And, you know, how do we craft of this book a, a vehicle for you in the world? so that you can have the impact that you have been born to have? And how do we also have the impact on your readers that you're here to help them experience? So I, I, I don't know if I'm answering that question too well, but really uh, my, my work is transformational editing. Is yeah. you know, how do, you know, at, and, and I do that at the, the language level. Um, I'm not the world's best proofreader, you know, the, the commas, like I'm good I'm at good it. I'm good at that. I am yeah, actually oh, are you? Okay. Like ridiculously so good. Send that over to Debbie. I, I you know, that's, I would rather uh, farm that out to people that I know and trust who, who love proofreading. And there are people that just get so excited about proofreading. <laughs> they're, they're the right people for that. You know, it's interesting. And I can't help myself because I spotted all the, the misspells, the, extra words, the wrong syntax, commas, this, that, I mean, all of it. Ugh. It's it's my eyes just, and I was actually interviewing somebody on my Dare to Dream podcast, and he published through a famous, famous publisher who actually I featured in this class at least a year ago, and I caught all these typos, and I was like, that's an anomaly to me because this is a ridiculously reputable publisher with huge names attached to him. And with, you know, I humbly pointed it out. I mean, mostly for the author, you need to know on page this and this. And I circled and I took screenshots and sent them and then also CC'd his editor because we had a friendly relationship. And the editor actually wrote back, did you know that most books are published with at least five top typos and I was like, that's a sucky answer, actually, because <laughs> it shouldn't be like that. Um, and I read, I have to read books for a living too, for what I do on my uh, podcast and for interviewing people. And that's not true. There's a lot of books with zero typos. 
Yeah, the, that, that really brings us to a really interesting topic. Um, and that's the editing process. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about a large publishing company, and I, I have a client going through that right now, she, um, we got her book into as good a shape as we could get it. She already had the, the publishing deal. And so after it left us, there was, there are three layers of editing over and above what we had already done. And the purpose of that primarily was to bring it into alignment with their house style. So we have these things called style guides in editing. I use Chicago Manual of Style. That's my style guide, my go-to style guide. And so when I'm editing and I have a question about something, I go see what Chicago Manual of Style says so that I make sure that I'm consistent. A, a large publishing company will have their own style guides. It might be based on CMOS or it might be their own publishing style that they've developed over many years. And it, it's about how do we deal with language? Where do we put the commas when we have quotation marks? Yes. What? Oh. Yes. Oh, yeah. Really. What is your take stuff. on that? Oh, the comma goes inside the quotation mark. Thank you. Typically, yes. Uh, yeah. And then, <laughs> then there's, if you want to start a fight, by the way, this is way off topic, but if you want to start a fight, I mean, a real argument among editors, bring up this thing called the Oxford comma. And the editors I know are all pretty introverted people. They love editing. They love sitting at their desk and editing. They're not typically gregarious, outgoing, let's go party kind of people. They, you know, they love their languages and their libraries and their dusty books. And, and, and but start asking about the Oxford comma and you will see like people practically leap out of their chairs. The Oxford comma is the comma that you use or don't use when you are listing things. So I went to the store and I bought milk, comma, bread, comma, and butter. So that second comma is the Oxford comma. We've added that in. Some people feel, no, 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 no. That comma has no place in that sentence. And I mean, silly little difference, but you kind of need to know whether how your client feels as an editor about the Oxford comma. Because people who are highly educated about language who may have had moms who were editors or English school teachers probably know about it and have an opinion about it. And it's 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 such a minuscule little thing. But I and I full disclosure, I believe in the Oxford comma. I, I like that little extra comma. Um, also, but, uh, I might say on a PC, Microsoft Word documents honors the Oxford comma. So when you do a spell check, it will always point out if you've got a second or middle-ish word and there's nothing after it, it will recommend you put it there. Yeah. So there's that. And also, thank you, <laughs> because that's another thing that makes me nuts when I look at a book, when there's quotations and there's a period outside of the quotation oh. <laughs> or an exclamation or a question or a comma or, 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 and it's like, no, you put it inside. It's part and parcel. Yes. And there are rules around that. Who knew? So as an author, you don't really know what all those rules are, but there are a lot of them enough that uh, Chicago Manual of Style is a massive resource database of the rules that we use when we are standardizing language for publication. And so again, back to the publishing process. So the editing process, a, a large ed publishing company will have tiers of editors that go through a manuscript prior to publication ending with a proofreader. In our self-publishing world, if you're self-publishing, you don't have those tiers of editors going through your work unless you pay for them yourself. And so it can really cause a lot of increase to your budget. If you're going to hire a developmental editor and then a copy editor and then a proofreader, those are three levels of editing that, that, a, that a traditionally published author gets included in their deal that you as a self-published author will have to hire in if you want to have the same quality of editing as someone who's traditionally published. I think that's not something that gets discussed quite a bit. You know, in this world of Amazon, we kind of think, oh, you know, the technology is there. You just write your book and throw it up on Amazon and you're good to go. And that's not making an equivalent level of quality with the books that are published by the larger companies. So it's something that I, I I really feel is a bit of a misservice, um, disservice that has been done to the authoring public in not making people aware of the level of uh, editing that's available through the big traditional companies. 
And I think I just want to jump into one other issue here that I think is relevant, and that's called an accuracy rate. And a lot of editors don't know what their accuracy rate is, but there is an expectation in publishing that there will be errors because nobody is perfect. And the accuracy rate, and especially if you're hiring one editor, only having one editor look at your book, uh, again, with, there's a cost implication to more editors, but with um, an accuracy rate, if you have uh, a 95% accuracy rate as an editor, that's considered extremely good. And what that means is that out of every 95 errors you correct, you will miss five. And I don't consider that to be awesome, to be honest. I think it's really good and it, not all editors can hit a 95% accuracy rate. And I've had occasion to have my accuracy rate tested and I'm a 99.92% accuracy rate. So, it's, uh, so I, I do edit to a really high degree of accuracy at the copy level too, actually. Um, but aside from that 99.1, uh, no, 99% is considered out of this world. And a 99% accuracy rate is really an elite level of editing, which again means if you correct 99 errors in someone's manuscript, you will miss one. And again, in the in editing circles, it's it's pretty well expected that we aren't perfect and we do miss stuff. And you know the the the, the more we train and the more better we get at it and the more discerning we are and the more we work on ourselves, the better we can become at it. But it's still, it, there just is not perfection out there usually. And I, it's funny, so Debbie, I'm draining on a little bit about this, but I love it when I catch an error in a book. <laughs> I see one and I go, oh my gosh, they missed one. And I found it, you know, because I know there are going to be errors. We don't always see the errors in a, in a traditionally published book. So. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. And what are your thoughts? Because there's, you know, with all the new trends of self-publishing and entrepreneurship, there are people out there who say, you know, I'm just going to give the book to five beta readers and have them go through it and send me their feedback. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, <laughs> number one, who are your beta readers? are they discerning individuals who are also part of your target audience? Are they people who are actually going to care about the material that you're writing about? Uh, otherwise, they may, be, they may find it kind of boring to go through an entire manuscript that, that isn't in their area of interest. So I would be very discerning about who I picked as a beta reader. And by the way, it's a big ask. You're asking somebody to read through what is going to become a two or 300 page book. Well, I can't read a 300 page book in an, in an afternoon. And even more than that, can I provide very valuable feedback in a couple of hours of beta reading somebody's book? No, 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 no. So you're asking people to do a big job for you. And so you, who you are asking is really relevant. And I guess the other thing is, are they people who actually have language capability? Like, are they better than you are at writing? And so, you know, that's something really important. And you might not know. They, you know, you might not know. They might like you, and they might have said, "I'll be your beta reader." Reader, but beyond that, are they really, really strong writers? Um, the other piece that I would say about beta readers, because I think beta readers are a good idea, but specify the kind of feedback that you would like them to give you. Because so many times people ask beta readers to read their book and the person comes back and says, yeah, I loved it. Great book. Well, how does that help you improve? You know, you want to ask for really specific things like, um, were there any areas where you didn't understand what I was saying? Could you please itemize those and the page number that you found them on and send that back to me? Um, did I make any idiosyncratic mistakes? I have a client, he's a PhD in legal philosophy. And every single time I edit something this guy has written, he makes the error of it's ITS versus it's IT apostrophe S. Every single time, this guy is brilliant and he's got a little idiosyncrasy. We all do. 
And so I would ask your beta readers if there are any errors that come up frequently that you just as a general rule should maybe fix. And finally, I would think too that you wanna ask them for the general tone. How do you come across in this book? Do, and again, back to, are you authoritative? Are you compassionate? Are you helpful? Like what, what is the general feel you get from reading this book what and 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 then you you can take that information and go okay is that how i want to be perceived in the reader so those are just a few things that you can do i yes i think beta readers are valuable but they are not enough they, they they can point you in a direction for improving your manuscript but typically they're not professional editors they haven't spent their entire life making books better for people and they also don't want to displease you by by saying things that aren't great about your book that you're might be going to be heard around like an editor is should be concerned about your feelings and should be compassionate and should also really care about how you're being perceived and are you being perceived in your brilliance and that's you know we're on your team like we're there to protect your reputation whereas your beta reader is maybe not on that on that path exactly i i loved that answer i concur and just another piece because all of that is so so accurate and the discernment is huge unless you're asking people who have written and published so many books and they're in your subject and in your field and one of the other things whether you're asking five or 15 people in the discernment area is you know is this just a voice in the dark and do I pay attention to it I would pay way more attention should you go that way I don't but should you go that way you need to find the pattern. So if five of the five people are saying, you know, in this list, Susan, that you gave so beautifully about look for these things, ask, for, ask these questions of them. Okay, if they're all check, 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 saying the same thing, I'd pay attention. But if it's a voice in the dark, if, you know, you need to understand what to let go of too, because it can really mess with the flow of this beautiful creation, you know, your book. So I'm going to okay. shift now to storytelling and ask you some questions there. I love this subject so much, and it's not often understood. Let's start with figuring out if your story is even good or not. Are there core questions to ask to figure out, is this story good? Am I telling a good story or not? So do you mean the overall narrative arc of the book or the specific anecdotes that you might be like, and, and are we talking fiction or nonfiction? I guess there's, that's a big distinction. I've too. got people here for both. So okay. I don't know if you can address both. And I want to say, I would, if it's possible, could you address both the overall arc of the book and then the independent stories? Okay. Still getting over a bit of a cold. So if you are writing fiction, you want to keep your readers on the edge of their seat throughout this entire experience. <laughs> In order to do that, you have got to have conflict. Mm -hmm. You have got to have a, a clear protagonist, somebody we're cheering for, and you need an antagonist, somebody who is consistently stopping the protagonist from getting what they want. And the whole arc of the story is about how the protagonist is trying to achieve their goal and the antagonist is getting in the way. Now, the antagonist could be the environment, for example. It could be weather. It could be a lot of different things. It's not necessarily one individual. It could be government. But it is definitely somebody who is frustrating the protagonist consistently. I uh, have done a lot of developmental edit in the fiction area. And I would say that's one of the biggest tweaks we need to make in the storyline is that people want to tell a nice story. They want to tell about something nice that happened. And that's great. But in order for your readers to really pay attention and to love the experience of being in, in, your, in your story with you, you, uh, you really do need to have conflict. Um, in order to get calm, and by the way, this is also appropriate if you're writing, say, a self-help book. Malcolm Gladwell is an amazing storyteller. That guy has got story figured out. So 
go read some Malcolm Gladwell if you really want some great examples of a terrific story. But but what he also works with that's applicable for nonfiction and also for fiction is talking about values. What values are at stake here? And so in the case of fiction, it helps for you to write down at the beginning of your book, at the, the start, so what are the values that this protagonist holds dear? And often that'll be what's, what gets frustrated in the arc of the story is, so if freedom is your protagonist's biggest value, then look for ways to take their freedom away in the storyline or limit their freedom. And that will create a great deal of interest among your readers. So, so in assessing the story that you have, if you're three quarters of the way through your fiction story, take a look at that and take a look at your protagonist. And do they change? Because that's something else that we want to see in a really good fiction book is a sense that that protagonist has gone on a journey. We, we, you know, we often use um, the hero's journey to take a look at that. It's very commonly used in storytelling. There are 12 steps to the hero's journey. There are specific steps along the journey that, um, and I invite you to Google that if you haven't already taken a look at the hero's journey, but th it really does map out a story that is used over and over and over again in Hollywood. I tend to like another story um, device called The Virgin's Promise. So. The Virgin's Promise was developed by a lady by the name of Kim Hudson, who I think is absolutely brilliant. And Kim Hudson was in screenwriter school where they teach the, the hero's journey. And she wanted to be a screenwriter. So she had to learn the 12 steps of the hero's journey. And she was listening avidly to the professor and put her hand up and said, excuse me, what's the feminine corollary to the hero's journey? So we know what the hero guy does what's the female counterpart to that? To which the professor said, well, women don't do anything interesting. There is none. So as you can imagine, them's fighting words for most of us. And Kim Hudson went off on the adventure herself of figuring out, well, what is the counterpart to the hero's journey for a female or a, or a, a feminine energetic uh, character? She looked at uh, Bible stories and Greek mythology and Egyptian stories and all the classic literatures, and she mapped it out and came up with what she calls the Virgin's Promise. So the Virgin's Promise has 13 steps. It's an internal voyage rather than an external voyage. So whereas the hero's journey involves the hero going on a physical trip, and he has foes to vanquish. So we've got ogres and trolls and uh, death stars, you know, Darth Vader. We've, he's got people who are frustrating him externally. The Virgin has an internal voyage and her conflicts tend to be much more internally framed. A, a female character or any gender identified individual can follow a hero's journey path and uh, same thing with the, the Virgin's Promise doesn't have to be a female. It can be anyone of any, any gender can follow that path. But it, it's just that this sense of it's more of an um, a individual growing to independence. So that, that character starts in a dependent state and moves into an independent state. And that's really the, the, the main difference between that and the hero is that it's a, a, a more of an internal journey. So anyway. So is, does your story follow an identifiable story arc? Is there a beginning, a middle, and an end? And also, I think for fiction, more than nonfiction, although it, in a memoir, I would say this is really relevant, is there an inciting incident? So do you start with something big that happens? Um, uh, so for example, uh, I was editing actually a, a memoir not so long ago. And it was all about a country where there was uh, a, another government came in and took all the men and shot them and boys and shot them. And, and then of course the women were all raped and it was a really horrendous situation. But the author had started with the main, the protagonist uh, upstairs in bed and she'd kind of woken up and it was a day like any others. And she was hearing some noise downstairs and she 
shared a room with her sister. And so she and her sister started talking and wondering what was going down. Well, there were soldiers in, in the main floor and her, their father was tied up. And so my recommendation was don't start with waking up slowly and wondering about the day. Start with racing down the stairs and seeing her has her father tied up and, you know, or, or when they're taking him out the door to shoot him, like, you know, start. And again, with God's blessings on all of the people who have ever experienced something so traumatic, uh, we, we still want to respect and revere the experiences people have had. And your people, your readers will pay much more attention if you start with some action. So that's the inciting incident. There needs to be something that's gripping us right from the beginning. It's helpful if you're writing a nonfiction book, say a self-help book. I always recommend people start their chapters with an anecdote, a story of some sort, and start it with some physical activities, something kinesthetic happening, some, some action happening. And this kind of uh, the, the arc of a fiction piece boiled down into a nonfiction anecdote, but uh, you do need that inciting incident to start us off. In a fiction story, you are at some point going to have to have a climax. You know, the, the, what's the big thing? What's this all leading to? The big scene where this is really, really, uh, all everything's coming to a head. And I think that's something else first time authors particularly don't, don't, aren't really tracking for the big exciting scene, but it needs to be big and exciting. So what is that for your protagonist where maybe they're facing down their antagonist in, you know, at the edge of a cliff fighting for survival, you know, that that's, that's, so that fight scene would then be your, your big climax. And then a denouement after there's, I'm, 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 I'm not a big fan of the, the anti-climax because I don't find it usually as interesting, but yeah, that, that's really where you're tying up all the loose ends of the story. You do need to do that. In, in a nonfiction book, my strategy for writing a chapter is, Start with that inciting incident, something active that's going on that will draw your reader in and tell that story. At least tell 80% of that story. And then you can segue into the, the material you want to teach or share with your readers. So in a self-help book and maybe, um, uh, so I've had lots of healers, uh, have helped lots of healers write books. So let's say it's a cure for Alzheimer's. They, they have information that will help people not have Alzheimer's. And so you start with that story and then you go into your teaching material. Here are the nine things that you need to know around uh, ensuring you don't get Alzheimer's. Tell that information. And okay, can I get really geeky here or am I boring everybody? Because I, I also have a formula for writing a chapter that is tried and true and oh, it's okay if i jump in there absolutely okay. yes please. okay so i i'm well, i is pretty geeky but it's it's effective there is a woman by the name of bernice i think her last name was mclaughlin who studied how people pay attention a harvard university professor and this was back in the 80s or 90s and she studied thousands and thousands of people to figure out well what are the differences in how people pay attention. And I'm going to boil this all down into kind of the Coles Notes version. It's a lot more complex than what I'm going to share here, but for, for those purposes, it'll serve you. Is she determined that 25% of the population cares about why something is important? They are very judgmental in how they spend their time. And if they don't hear why they should pay attention or why this is valuable to them, they're out of there. You've lost them. So uh, you need to, after you've told your, told your little story or part of your story, 80%, then you need to explain why this information is important for people. So you capture those people who care about why and who are going to stop reading if they don't get it right away. The next 25% of your readers care about what it is. So if you've got a cure for Alzheimer's, tell them why it's important and then go into, well, what is this magic cure for Alzheimer's? What are the nine components that people need to be aware of in order for them to be living bigger, health, healthier, longer lives? Uh, and that's because that 25% of the population uh, that cares about what information, what something is, 
they will check out if they don't get that after the why. They'll pay attention to the why, but they're not especially interested in why. What they really want is what is it? And an example I can give of that, by the way, coming from a background of journalism initially in my life was if you read an average news article, quite often you will find out, say, a fire at uh, Young and Maine. So here's the what information is that Young and Maine, 12 fire trucks were involved, 52 firefighters, seven building blocks were affected and 250 people had to be evacuated. That's what. That's not why the fire started. You might get that. And usually a good journalist will be told you have to find out why the fire started if you can. But the, the why information is usually very minimal in a typical journalistic article. Uh, and then, um, but that's really the focus for most journalists. They, they really care about what. Uh, the third category is how. Well, how do you apply this cure for Alzheimer's? Because the next 25% of the population, they're like engineers. How do you build a bridge? And they will sit through the why, they'll sit through the what, but you need to tell them how. And if your default pattern has no how in it, like you don't care about how either, then it will really serve you to consciously remember to include information about how something works. So how does your cure work? How often do you have to take how often do you go for walks? How often do you play brain games? Like how, how do you apply this to your own life? It's the application part that the how is. And then finally, the final 25% of the population are the, the visionary thinkers. So what are the implication of all of this? So what, what big result will this make possible in my world? Quite often CEOs are these implication people. Okay, you've told me why, I got what, you give me how, now so what? How can I use this information? What's it gonna do to make my life better? And that kind of information in, all, in our Alzheimer's example might be, well, if you, if you use this protocol consistently over the next 10 months, then you will find that your life is, is your, your vibrant mental life is lengthened by an average of two to five years, statistics say. So you're, you're embedding all of that. It has to be in that order, by the way, why, what, how, and implications. But it, that way you're, you're hitting all segments of, of your reading public in, way, in the way that they need to, to uh, obtain the information. So that's called the format. You can find information about that online as well. But so back to the structure of a chapter for a nonfiction book would be start with your anecdote, a little story about what what happened or that will draw people into the story. Tell them why, why it's important, what it is, how it works and what the implications are. And then circle back to the rest to the story that you started at the beginning. Now that this is called a, a nested loop. It's called a loop. It's not actually less nested. That's pretty complex. But um, so what you're doing is you're full circling that story and it's like tying the whole thing up with a nice bow, referring back to the story, kind of finish it off with, with a few more details about the story at the end. And so that is a million dollar movie star technique for writing a chapter. It's, it's, it's formulaic, but really you can do so many things within it and get that right brain activated with ideas and you know, that was huge. Metaphors. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. That was amazing. That's such good information. I'm taking notes myself. Thank and you. Um, thank you, because I know there's a lot of people out there who can apply what you just said to their books. I'm going to open up right now to questions. So if anybody has a question for Susan, please let us know. Raise your hands or Ellen. I'm going to bring you on and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Great. Hi. Um, thank you, Susan. Can you can you all hear me all right? Yes. OK, I have a new mic, so I wasn't sure. Um, so I have a whole bunch of questions, actually. So I'm just going to try and I'm writing YA fiction. It's my first time writing um, fiction, but I've been a writer of other kinds all my life. So um, I had a question. You kind of answered it. Can the antagonist be the inner self? Yes. Okay. It can. It's trickier to write though because we aren't rooting for the antagonist. 
Right. We, we, do, we don't like the antagonist. As a reader, we don't want to like the antagonist. Okay. We want to, like, it, it can be done, but as I say, I think it's tricky. We want the antagonist to be somebody we, we, we don't cheer for. And the inner self, we, I mean, I, I kind of cheer for the inner self. My own demons have been, <laughs> okay. have been big and bad, but yeah, it, but you can do it, but it's that you're carving out quite a project. Yeah. Well, I'm sort of doing, you know, her reactions to everybody is the, you know, she's reading the room wrong and it's a developmental thing, but anyway, so I'll, I'll put that in my, uh, in my pipe. If I can just ask quickly, I'll leave my other questions because I see other hands, but I didn't realize that I don't know the difference between uh, a copy editor and a proofreader. That's a very simple question. Sure. So, and that's a really good question and hardly anybody knows the differences, to be honest. So we have the developmental editor, which is more big picture. The copy editor is working at the, lang the language level. The words, the do the sentences make sense? Is the grammar correct? Are, are the prepositions the right prepositions? Everybody has trouble with prepositions, by the way. Um, very common to have trouble with prepositions. Uh, do, the, do the nouns and verbs work well together? Or, you know, that's copy editing, just to make sure the sentences are correct. Then, and that can go on for a long time. There's also this little other category that we often lump in with copy editing, which is called line editing. And line editing is about voice. So is the author using words consistently the same way throughout? Maybe they have, a, maybe you have an accent. Maybe the, the narrator has an accent or one of the characters has an accent. Well, the line editor will make sure that accent is accurately represented all the way through the book, unless there's a reason that it should change. So are, are, there, are there words that are misused intentionally throughout the book? That's part of the author's voice. Well, that line editor needs to make sure that the words are misused intentionally all the way through the book. There, there are times when that's appropriate. So that's the line editor. And then the proofreader is the person who's kind of like the cleanup squad. And they, the, your copy editor and your line editor should be working at the level of punctuation and grammar and all the rest of it as well. But the proofreader, it's like they, they carry this to an art form. They are so tuned in to the minutia of the, the detail of the language that they, nothing gets by them. And I think, you know, there's a personality correlation in your editors to all of this. The, the developmental editors love the big picture and they tend to be really visionary. They, have, they will buy into your vision for the book and they will help you expand your vision for your book. When we get down to, so that's very big picture thinking. When we get down to proofreading, that's really granular, detail work. So, and so, and I happen to have a brain that works well at the big picture and works really well at the detail level as well. Um, but not everybody does. Like you probably know for yourself whether you're more of a big picture thinker or a detail person. So, if you're more of a big picture thinker, here's here's a tip: when you're talking to potential editors, ask them because you want somebody who's going to fill in for what your blanks are. So if you know you're a visionary, then you're going to want somebody who really loves the copy editing aspect of things. Well, I hope that helped explain that. Did that, Ellen? That yes, good? that was great. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and now I'm going to ask um, Karen. Your hand is up. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi there. Thank you Susan, for coming here. I've just so enjoyed what you've been talking about. It's been wonderful. So my question to you is, is where I am with my book is that I'm writing short stories about things that have happened in my life. And so how would the kind of structure that you're talking about be applied here? Or is that not really what's going on? Because every story is its own little world. Like, I don't, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to apply. Yeah, the, stru the, the structure is a little bit different for a short story. I love short stories, by the way. Um, my second book was a collection of short stories. And, and I would, you know, just time for me. I haven't done more. But so in a short story, you're kind of taking the, 
the fiction model. So you're going on a journey, your, your character is going on some kind of adventure of some sort. Whether, so we don't usually have time to get into a hero's journey path on a short story. And in fact, I'm not a big hero's journey person, to be honest. Like I think it, 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 at some point you do have to structure it, but it's, it can be very confining for some of us. But with a, a short story, you're usually setting out to solve one problem. Your main character has one problem ahead of them. And that's the, the real focus of that, that one story. In a, in a fiction, in a novel, you might have multiple themes and multiple issues and multiple problems and certainly multiple characters. But you, so your character, number of characters, first of all, is gonna be fewer in a short story. It may only be that protagonist who might be the narrator, but that's, um, they need a problem to solve. You wanna, you just wanna start them with some action. You want them to have a lot of conflict and that might be internal conflict. And I'm, I'm not sure I'm giving you really concrete assistance on that because that's that to me even as I say that it's sounding pretty generic do you do you want to say a little bit more about what the issue is I don't have a necessarily specific issue uh, in the moment because I'm, I'm enjoying writing these stories and they're very cathartic and you know I want to make them as as, as good as I can you know so okay. it's more of that you know uh, and and as I move forward into other ones I can be more mindful now of how to structure this yeah, so what I can also tell you about a lot of the short stories that I've edited, uh, kind of some typical things that I correct for in short stories is setting. So make sure that you place your character, and this would go for fiction as well. Make sure that we can see where your character is. Are you giving enough detail around where they are in space? Uh, you know, are they standing on a beach? Are they sitting down at a desk? What well, what's the desk look like? How big is the desk? Is it a big oversized, very masculine looking desk? Or is it really a, you know, kind of a, an art nouveau kind of she she little desk? Like give us a little bit of detail around the setting, which will reflect uh, on your character as well. You don't want to describe everything to death because you know description gets dull, but you want to give enough detail that we can make some wise guesses about your character based on where they are and what they're doing, how they're dressed. Um, what, what actions are they taking that might hint at where they are as well? Because, because I find that's typically there's no setting. I, you know, like, I don't know where they are. And I don't like, I can't, your reader needs to see something of that. So that would be one thing as you're crafting the story, as they're going through space and time, show us what, what your character is seeing. And also, I would also make sure you embed some emotion into what's happening. And because that's also something quite typically, there's no feeling like there is structure. We go from A to B and then on to Z, Z. I'm Canadian, so I say Z. Some you know, stuff happens and the, the character goes on a journey. But I've, I got nothing. I don't feel anything as a result. So work with emotion. And that's, that is something that comes with, it's, it's, it's a craft, like that comes with practice in hinting at feelings, at sharing, like just a little tweak of an, an eyebrow can express some emotion, but don't leave it out for crying out loud because that's actually what's gonna keep your reader interested is, is the emotional impact, particularly in a short story, because you don't have as much space to develop the character. So, um, and your voice also is something that's really, really powerful in a short story. You can say a lot with very few words in a short story. Okay. Those, right. So those are just some things. I, and I, to be honest, I wouldn't worry a whole lot about the structure. Write what's in your heart, particularly with the short story. Write what is in your heart because you, you know the story. You mm -hmm. lived it. If they're based on your life. Mm -hmm. You've already lived that. You know what the beginning and the middle and the end is. Mm -hmm. So take us on that little adventure. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Um, Anyone if else? I can, just, can I just say one word about that? Sorry, Debbie. Please. Uh, there are known to be two kinds of writers out there. There are the plotters and the pantsers. And I don't know if you talked about plotters and pantsers 
at all, Debbie? Is that something you guys go into? No. Okay. So a plotter is someone who figures out the entire book before they actually write it. And so they plot it. And there is a really good book that I love. Actually, there's some really good, lots of really good books, but um, Saves the Cat Writes a Novel is a really great book about structure. Um, and and it, it breaks everything down into scenes or beats of your book. And so you want to map that out ahead of time. If you're a plotter, you love that mapping stuff out. If you're a pantser, you fly by the seat of your pants. And so you just write. You just write because it's fun to write and you don't know what you're writing and you don't know where your characters are going to take you. And it's just so fun. And, oh, this could happen. And that, oh, look, let's do this next. And you just get really crazy wrapped up in the adventure of writing. And those are pantsers. I tend to be a pantser when I'm writing. When I'm editing, I have the luxury of, okay, this isn't my book. This is someone else's book. I, I better pay attention to the, to the structure here. You know, like I tend to impose the structure on as an editor. And I do that myself in my own writing after I've pantsed it out. So I, I'm not a, a big plotter ahead of time. But the structure has to be there or you will lose your readers. Here's, here's the other thing that I've discovered is that being an author and writing a book is an immensely creative, soul-inspiring activity. And it just moves us in ways and we grow in ways we never thought possible. So when we're writing, quite often we are spewing that, that language out onto the page and it just feels so good and so cathartic and so, uh, so much, in, we're so much in our beingness as we're writing. It's, it's such a glorious experience. And reading is a linear experience. So the creative aspect of writing is, is, can be very, very magical. But your readers need it, your writing presented in specific ways so they can access the magic. And that's what the structure does. It provides a scaffolding on which your creativity can sit so that your readers can absorb it. And, you know, not to the extent of, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in, in structuring the life out of what you're writing, but there needs to be enough structure there that your reader can, can grasp that and and again, that's where knowing who your ideal reader is really helps, is who are these people? Do they need a lot of structure? Are they, are they accountants or are they holistic healers? So that'll make a difference to how your information is presented. As well. Yeah, good point. Really good point. Um, let me see. Why is this pin not? Here we go. <laughs> um, yes, great point. And one of the ways that I help the writers to wrap their brains around this because you got to find your sweet spot. There's a way you operate and you honor your sweet spot. And one idea is that in the very beginning, the inception of your book, you write down all the bullet points. What do you need to cover in your book? Those bullet points will become chapter titles. Of course, you can change them later on, but they are your guide. So when you sit down, you're not blank and saying, what am I going to do next? You say, oh, Chapter one, that's the bullet point, and you start your writing on that. And then chapter two, and this is how you do your book. And this is somebody who functions very well in a structure like this. And then when I wrote my books, I just, whoop, I, I leaped, you know? And I've had people go, how did you do that? Like, I don't know, I just flowed. It came out of me and that's what I honored. But I also think if you think flowing is very good for you, but you notice that the way you're writing, there's this haphazard quality. It's really not connecting. You know, when you read it back, I always say when you sit down to pick up writing again, you've written yesterday, for instance, and you're coming back again today. If you're coming back, you need to read everything you wrote the day before so you can pick up in the energy and keep going, right? You'll be back in the flow of your own voice and be able to start writing. But if you're doing that, the point is, and you're finding this writing isn't making sense, it's not your job to edit at that point, it may be your job to stop and go back and create an outline for yourself. So you have better structure that lets you know where you're going, where the big moment is in the book and et cetera. You, you do wanna map that out. So 
I appreciate this conversation. I think all of this is super important. And I've got a question here from Art who says, what level of editing is it that you are, your offer is for us? So Susan, create an offer, professionally edited sample of your manuscript to move your book forward. She said it's 5,000 words for 497. You've got the URL here. And um, what, what type of editing is that for? It, I actually work at both levels at the same time. So it is developmental and it copy editing. And what that means is as I'm reading through it, I'll identify where you've repeated yourself, where you're not making sense, where you've made logical leaps, what you're missing maybe in, in the development of that sample, but also fixing the sentences, if we can call it fixing. So I combine both of them in one pass at the editing. Um, what I also deliver with that is a report, I've done edit memo which summarizes what I've done to the manuscript. So again, prepositions tend to be a pretty common thing that I fix. Uh, sentence structure, you know, but, but maybe your sentence structure is flawless. And maybe there were other little idiosyncrasies that I found myself correcting consistently through, throughout that passage. So I'll, I do a little report. And I also, in that report, if I have got ideas for you for expansion, because I like expansion, then I will summarize those in that report as well. But I, but I also comments in the sample itself, like I edit right on the manuscript, my, my word. Um, and that does, by the way, need to be in Word, not a PDF. So in Word, uh, pages I can convert to Word as well. But then, um, uh, where was I going with that? Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I, I change the sentences uh, in tract changes so you can actually see what I'm recommending. You don't have to do anything I tell. I recommend you, it's, you're the author, you get to pick, but uh, you can see the changes I'm recommending. And then there'll be comments in the comments pane as well that you can see where, where I might not have understood what you've done, but maybe I've understood everything, so. Excellent, okay. Anybody else have any questions? And I can't see everybody at the same time. So oh. De Dolores gonna... has a question there. Oh, thank you. Hi, Dolores, come on in and ask your question. Hi, um, no, very easy. Uh, I just needed that title again. You said Saves the Cat. Saves the Cat Writes a Novel. Okay, great. I'm pretty sure I've got that right. I've got a copy at my bed. It's my bedtime reading. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that, yeah, great. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, so it's uh, Jessica Brody is the author. Saves the Cat writes a novel, the last book on novel writing you will ever need. And it is outstanding. It's an awfully good book. The other person I follow is um, Sean Coyne. He's got something called The Story Grid, I think it's called. Um, another look at, at novel structure. I've, I've read him. Yeah, The Story Grid. Um, and he, he boils it down into five steps in your five discrete steps in your book, in your novel. And uh, actually, Sean Coyne has a great podcast. If you're looking for a super resource on, on uh, structure, book structure, check out the Story Grid podcast. It's outstanding. And it's Sean Coyne, and I forget the fellow that, he's, that he does the podcast with, but they talk about book structure. And it's, I've, I just love it. I follow. I follow them as well. Excellent. Hey, Alexandra, great. What is your question? Oh, you're muted, Alexandra. Muted. We've all done it. <laughs> bad, it's bad. <clears throat> now I got a cat in my throat. Mm. Sorry. Um, I wanted to know if you could just talk a little bit about the art of coming up with a title in specifically for me, my interest is a, a self-help book. Yeah, and I wish I was really good at that. <laughs> All right. And I'm not. Um, there is, uh, let me see, there's a, a colleague of mine by the name of Claudia Gear. 
uh, she's an, an agent in New York. And that is something that she has, she's actually talked to my mastermind group about. Um, there is, she has a formula. And I'm just seeing, I'm just wondering if she has that available on her website as a, as a free download. What is her last name? Gear, G-E-R, G-E-R-E. She works only very selectively these days. So, but, but I know when she spoke to my mastermind group, she, she did have some kind of download that related to book titling. And she was very interesting. She's taken people from, uh, you know, she works as a book coach and a lit, but as a literary agent, particularly once someone signs with her, then she will take them through to a traditional publishing contract. And her comments were very interesting to me in that she has said, you know what, it, you never know. You can come up with what you think is the absolute best book title in the world. And then when they get to the traditional, like to the publishing stage, they have, the publishers have reasons for reconfiguring all of that. And so it, um, it, is, an, it is an art form. And I'm sorry, I am not all that good at it, to be honest. It's, it's, it's about snappy, catchy phrases. That's right. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't know why her website is not coming up for me. No worries. While you're looking for that, I'll, I'll throw in my five cents here. You know, a book title is general. If you look at your bookshelf right now, you will notice that book titles are short. Book titles are generally three words, right? And they should be, they should elicit something, compel something such as curiosity, like an insider secret, like surprise and humor, like controversy or being contrarian like specific or powerful benefit, like novelty or unique mechanism. And the reason why is because, you know, your book cover is your greatest sale or losing sales. It will either cause somebody, compel somebody to buy it or compel somebody to be retracted from it. And you want them by the cover, meaning the picture that, that is on it, the way the fonts are, the way the, the uh, not just the, the photo, whatever you're using or painting, but also it's super important to have the colors be such that it's also compelling. So you've got your title, very important. That is a big sales pitch for you. And then the other thing is your subtitle. And so your subtitle is actually what describes the book. What's the inside of the book? And I'll give you some examples of book titles such as nine fast formulas for fame or I'm trying to think of some the thief's mission a good night's sleep stumbling on happiness dreaming in code getting things done i'm going to also look at some here things books i have here the energy code Way of the Shaman, Wisdom to Success, Love in 90 Days. So you see, it's very catchy. You have a sense of what the book is about and what its benefit might be. But then the subtitle is what actually breaks it down for you. This is the absolute, here's the content value you're going to get inside of the book. Yeah. And it is, it's really important. It's real estate on your book and you wanna make sure you use it wisely. And it's also, it's interesting because it's often for people kind of like saying, what do you do for a living? And you know, you have one sentence to say it and everybody gets in their head and you know, you don't know what you don't know. However, once you have some distance from it, I always recommend just start talking. That's sometimes how I found the titles of my books. It was like, well, what's your book about? And, you know, my second book, I, I don't even remember the original title, but at one point I was just speaking it out loud. Here's why to read my book. And, you know, basically the essence is this is the wisdom that will bring you to success. And I was like, oh, wisdom to success, done. And then I had a subtitle, of course. So that's what I recommend. Um, just talk. Don't try to get real kitschy with words because it's it can be very confusing and frustrating. But I would just write and write and you know widen back, and 
it is like the homeopathic essence of your book. What is that? And uh, I know we talked about that a little bit, Alexandra, and that would be my recommendation is, you know, to really know what your offer is and the why of somebody, what they should read it. And it, you can do it in a funny way. You can do it in a serious way. You can do it in a clever way. You can poignant, all of that. Uh, they all read well, but you just have to find that essence. But the great news is once you find it, it's like, yes, you know, in your heart, you've landed. I hope that helps. That's a fabulous explanation, Debbie. Really great. And we have just a couple of minutes, folks. I am going to, again, go through her package and just say that if you have a portion of your manuscript that you would like to have professionally edited, this is a way you can test drive working with Susan Crossman. You can see what the editing relationship is like. You could also get very honest and compassionate feedback on your writing. And so she's put together an editing package just for my community. It leverages Susan's decades of professional editing and writing experience and the thousands of hours she spent training in this area for reader engagement, personal transformation. The result is a professional edited sample of your manuscript that moves your book forward. You absolutely want to go to the URL she provided so you can get that package at that special price and she, she'll know um, it's not the price probably she usually charges. But again, uh, I'll put the URL into what we've got here. And Susan, in the last few minutes, will you just say, what is the timeline? People who are writing a book, what is the timeline for getting on board with an editor? What do you mean to be, how long it takes to edit or when should, at what when point? When should they your... be looking for an editor? Yes. Well, I would tune into your gut, first of all and trust your, your inner wisdom on that one. Um, but I, I think most people start looking around about the time when they're three quarters finished their manuscript. They're, they're about three quarters of the way through and they're going, oh, there's another next step. Okay, but I better find an editor. And I think that's probably a good time to start looking. You know what your book is. You, you do want to interview a few people now. I mean, there's me, of course, and I'd love to work with all of you, but maybe we're not the right fit. And if not, then if you're in the United States, you might look on the American Copy Editor Society page, ACES, and that's a directory of editors in the United States. There's also the Editorial Freelance Association, which has a directory of editors. Uh, in Canada, we have Editors Canada. Uh, editors.ca. I'm a, I'm a member of Editors Canada and ACES. So what you do then is just start doing a search and looking for the keywords that you feel are relevant to your book. So about three quarters of the way through, I would say, and then start interviewing and start asking questions and start figuring out who the right match for you is. When you have a fully finished manuscript, and that means you've gone through it so often that you're sick to death of it. Like really that's about the point when you're ready for an editor is you just can't see any more mistakes. You have no idea what to do next. Then it's time to take it to an editor. Uh, do not send an editor an unfinished manuscript or one where you still have a lot of work to do on it. What I do, and I don't know if everybody does it the same way, but I will do a sample edit. And what that means is people will send me a fragment of their manuscript usually a couple of thousand words and I will I will edit it and I will do a sample edit and I'll see how long that takes me and I charge by the hour some people charge by the word um, for a developmental edit I will charge by the word but for kind of that that everything together edit I'm I do it by the hour and that will uh, allow me to figure out okay how long is this going to take me so we need the final word count if you're going to do it that way and so how many words is the total manuscript? Let's say 60,000. So the number of hours times the number of words, and then you get an estimate with that of what it's gonna to cost to write your book or to edit, get your book edited. So the editing process itself, uh, like I say, I've had clients that I've worked with for a couple of years. That's not typical. The really, the, the lag time in there is how long are you hanging on to it? 
And so we do a round of edits and then send that back to the client. The client reviews the edits, figures out which ones they liked, which ones they didn't like. Uh, hopefully you like all of them, and, but, but there will be spaces they have to fill in some blanks there. So how long that takes you dictates when that goes back to the editor for the next round of edits. Um, generally, certainly for me, a typical is about three rounds of edits. So back and forth to me three times and back to you before it's ready for publication. Uh, sometimes manuscripts are very problematic. I, I had one guy um, and he had his table of contents and he sent me the manuscript and the first three chapters were pretty good. And then came chapter four, which was 40,000 words in one chapter. And so that took a substantial, that, oh my that a substantial amount of work. Like, <laughs> okay, we're, uh, it was. So, so I never know quite what I'm going to get, but, yeah. and none of it's wrong, by the way. It's not, that wasn't wrong. It was just, he'd never but 40,000 words is almost a whole book, you know? Yes. <laughs> In one chapter. Yeah. Right, so, great. yeah. So sometimes it takes longer and how long your book is will also determine how long the editing process is, how long it takes to edit your book. A lot, a lot of things going on. Yeah, that's great because, you know, as I always say, and we're wrapping it up, folks, books are not a linear process. So you get halfway to three quarters of the way through and exactly like Susan said, you must be thinking ahead at that point because otherwise it's going to take you forever to do your book. You cannot write and finish, do the drafts. Oh, I wonder who's out there for editing. Oh, I wonder who could market my book. Oh, like it will be forever. You must take a pause and a breath. And that's when you stop and say, as Susan said, look at a couple of people, interview them. Now you, you got the 411 here. It was beautiful. Decide who you want to work with. Maybe do a sample with them, like with Susan, and then you will know. And same thing, I do this. I tell everybody: if you are ready to become an international best-selling author, and dear, I hope you are. After all that work, so people can have eyes on your book and know it exists, and we can really exponentialize your visibility. Then you come to me also three quarters of the way through, and you say, "I'm ready to hire you." I'm working in the background. I know what I'm doing. I do all the heavy lifting. You don't have to do a thing. And we get you positioned so that when your book is published and ready, everything is flowing with Susan's editing, with my marketing, with anybody else you bring on board. It is so important for you as an author to have this kind of flow happening. And once you do a book once, trust me, once you get that under the belt, you've gone through the rites of fire, you'll be great for every book after that. You'll know so much about the process. And Susan, here at the end, I just want to thank you so much for coming on and for the brilliance that you shared today. This was incredible. Really, I enjoyed it. Me too, Debbie. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I wish everybody the best of everything with your books. And May it expand you in countless amazing and profitable and productive and happy ways. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. You've been amazing. I adore you all. We'll see the book writers, uh, debbie-inger.com slash visible visionaries. We'll see you in two weeks for our regular class. Mm -hmm. And write, write, write between now and then. Yeah. This will be up in your platform. Bye.